Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we put out there on the internet. Go to focuscompounding.com to get free investment write-ups, blog posts, all of Jeff's singular diligence write-ups, all at Focus Compounding in a centralized place, blog posts going all the way back to 2005, and you can get access to all of it just out of the goodness of our heart at focuscompounding.com. If you're interested in learning more about our money management services, reach out to me at andrew at focuscompounding.com. What is Focus Compounding? If you're familiar with our work, we invest with a framework that we go over here on the podcast, and we're looking to buy what we think are high-quality companies that are trading in a pocket of the market that tends to go overlooked by other market participants. We feel like there are more opportunities for ideas, and Jeff's always trying to find something where he could always find something to do. And from his experience... Uh, it's focusing in this overlooked pond uh, that gives him those opportunities. So if you want to get more information on that, you could go to focuscompound.com and hit that invest with us section. I am required uh, to say, be sure to read the disclaimers as well, as we are a, a registered investment advisor registered with the state of Texas. You could get that disclaimer at Focus Compounding. Dot com. Uh, we do run a hedge fund and we have a managed accounts arm. Uh, the investment minimums are different. For the fund, it's a $2 million minimum. There's no management fee. The incentive fee is 15% of the profits with a high watermark. And then the managed accounts, the investment minimum is 250000 with 0% incentive fee and a 2.5% management fee. So reach out to me at Andrew Focus Compounding. I would love to talk with you about our money management services, the pros and cons of both vehicles. There are some differences. There are some similarities. Let's chat about it. Reach out to me at andrew at focuscompounding.com. So today is October 12, 2022. We could quickly hit on the markets. And where do we stand, Jeff? Well, we stand down about 25% year to date. Uh, The 10-year yield is at 3.894%. Uh, crude oil, $87, and natural gas, $6.41. A crude oil and natural gas has basically been in a range uh, for uh, you know the past couple of months. Uh, but the S&P 500, we have retested the lows, and we are down 25% year-to-date. And before I get your updated thoughts on the market, Jeff, I'm kind of curious to um, read this out loud and see what your thoughts are, because you invested uh, through the 2000.com crash. And Cassandra BC, that is Michael Burry, um, he says, another feeling I'm getting is mid to late 2000. Free cash flow, totally on sale and ignored, while former momentum stocks are coming down, but not far enough. And darling, in quote, better businesses still had a ways to fall. Value was about to take off for years, despite more crash on the way. So basically, he's talking about the feeling that he's getting in the market is the rotation from momentum growth stocks to value stocks that happen in uh, mid-2000. And then he was uh, tweeted a few days later about that, how he said, low price to cash flow businesses are different today versus 2000 because they will buy back stock, buy back debt at a discount, and in general, manage capital structure better, make some statistical values math problems that more or less must work out. And then he tweeted again, companies that are heavily leveraged, but have the cash flow and termed out debt have options today, including reducing their debt loads at a significant discount brought on by higher rates. But as Graham said, in such a case, better off buying the stock. So I'm just kind of curious, Jeff, from your experience, because you invested through 2000 and you have always followed this value investing framework. I'm kind of curious, do you agree with this? What are your general thoughts on where we currently are? Free cash flow does seem to be coming back into the picture. What are your thoughts on this? Um, Yeah, I think there's some similarities to 2000. Uh, What he says about darling better businesses still had a ways to fall is true. 
for momentum stock. So, you know, I looked at a bunch of stocks that are down a lot, you know, more than 50% or so in the last year, and many of them are very expensive. So they would still be over 50% or so overpriced to what would happen in a normal market. And that was true in 2000. It's true today. Um, that was a lot less so going into the financial crisis. Although stocks weren't particularly cheap, um, there was not a lot of very expensive stocks. Um, so that is different this time. These are the kind of stocks where we talk about where I say, you know, you really don't want to pay more than 10 times sales for anything. That kind of um, stock. And there's actually more than you would think of those, even when they're down a lot that are pretty expensive. So that part is a little unusual. And that is something that we saw similar to 2000. And also similar is the way in which some, uh, you know, it was almost a year ago or something where we had really bad results in the very speculative, like no profits at all, no profits ever um, reported tech companies, right? And things like that. And so the market overall uh, last year, say for us, for people who invest more broadly and don't invest in tech, um, didn't notice that the things weren't going too well uh, price-wise. Uh, and then it, it's a year later, it's more generally across the S&P. And that was very similar to 2000, where you saw very big declines first in those speculative things, but people who are in the higher price still, but more general uh, businesses in the S&P weren't really concerned about it. And then, you know, a year later or something, they were concerned as their stocks went down just because they were kind of expensive, um, not because they were in, uh, not because the businesses weren't very uh, solid, you know, so it took a while for the more solid businesses to experience the problems that originally you had in the, you know, the pets.com famously and, and stocks like that happened first. And then the Cisco's and things like that happened a little later. And then it took even longer to get to the Coca-Cola's and the Home Depot's and the things that were had nothing to do with tech, but just had gone very expensive. So uh, that's similar. You know, the last year in some ways is similar to that. Do you think historically the most amount of turnover you have had in your portfolio has been when things really pull back and come back down to earth, valuations come back, there's volatility in the market? Do you think that's true and would that be because of just the nature of investing that you're doing right you're selling off more expensive positions other companies are getting a lot cheaper that you know you would had on your list of you know one day wanting to buy your wish list um do, would you say that's true that the most amount of turnover you typically have is in points of or moments of panic or volatility yes i'd say um 2000 uh decline then and the financial crisis decline and um, that's generally what causes the highest uh, turnover. You know, falling stock prices, rapidly falling stock prices, uh, a lot of volatility, uh, prices of different things moving with less complete correlation between them. You know, so some things are falling more dramatically than others. Um, you know, all of that. Even when we talked, I think, last podcast about, say, the UK versus the US or something, um, you're starting to see differences around the world, whether it's because of currency things or performance of one stock market is better or worse than another. All of that means that everything's not moving together so much. Um, where you have the lowest turnover, where, where I've had the lowest turnover, is when everything is generally moving somewhat upward pretty consistently. Whereas uh, a lot more volatility downward um, is is what we're looking for in terms of the price um, to, to make it more attractive to switch into something else, especially if say we had some cash or something, but just in general, more dramatic movements. So just more things, you know, um, uh, quantitatively people would say like, you know, you're, it's, you're having more things moving two or three standard deviations in a lot of different um, asset classes, uh, different things around the world, whatever, as compared to each other, you just have more of these unusually large moves. And that tends to cause unusual moves in lots of different um, kinds of companies. For for instance, it's not necessarily like a stock being down 50% or something that's particularly attractive. You know, Netflix or um, Amazon or something will be down 50% all the time. Uh, what's interesting is when we talk about stocks like we did 
last time about, say, uh, Hilton food or uh, a Domino's, right? Domino's has some leverage and stuff, but it's the same sort of thing. If you have something in food and something that's very predictable that's down by huge amounts, that's more the um, th- that's more interesting. And in many cases, the the move might only be in total size, similar to what you're used to seeing in lots of stocks, but a move of say, so you're looking at something there where it's down that's in us dollars, but um, Mm -hmm. it's down um, 60% or something in a year. That kind of move is a lot more uh, statistically unusual for something. I mean, I don't know specifically about Domino's in the UK, but certainly Hilton food or something would be a more predictable stock. Um, That kind of move would be, uh, more unusual than say a 50% or a 60% move in, um, you know, uh, a semiconductor stock or something where that would be fairly common. So large movements in more predictable things are a big reason for, uh, higher turnover that we might have. So it's not just, um, you know, it's not just a stock being down 50% or something. It's, Sort of like um, when you read about the history of Berkshire and Buffett, you know, it's a stock that in otherwise is usually a very predictable thing. Um, So it's something where the really uh, bad IPOs and early trading history for like affiliated publications in Boston or um, Washington Post, um, some of the ad agencies, you know, those are very predictable businesses. So that's different than say, you know, an aluminum company or an oil company moving by 50% back then. So it's the unusual nature of the moves really more so even than the percentage. There'll always be some stocks that are up or down by huge amounts, but it's when those stocks are normally pretty predictable businesses, predictable companies that are having moves that normally you're used to seeing only in like cyclicals or speculative companies. And to that point, I mean, Let's say even since we started focus compounding, are you seeing more opportunities today in those types of businesses than you have over the past, you know, five years, four to five years? Yes. Yeah. I, I said the same thing. I would agree with that. I How mean, people could yeah. say like through COVID, right? People would be like, well, actually things got cheap in COVID. But That's correct. We've talked yeah. about this a lot of times on the podcast, right? That was like, A, things were cheap for like, like I mean, like stupid cheap for like two days. And that was also mm. peak fear, peak hysteria, peak, you know, holy cow, right? I mean, we were uh, on our end. A lot of our thought process was, you know, is the companies that we're currently invested in going to survive this, right? What What's their capital structure? Do they have any debt? You know, what does a complete shock going to zero uh, from like a revenue standpoint mean for this company, right? But I, I would agree with that. I would say I'm seeing more opportunities um, from like really strong moded predictable businesses that are trading at decent free cash flow yields yeah and the other thing that's happened during covid and um is also i'm sure to some extent true today is that the other reason why someone might not buy something is unpredictability of future funding situations so that's why a fund would not do it because obviously if they're having inflows and stuff that they can count on then they'd be really willing to buy things and not worried about holding cash and things like that um obviously in the middle of covid they'd worry about that so that has a big impact and it's probably a big impact on what you see um today in that a large part of why someone wouldn't why some institution stuff wouldn't be buying things is because of concerns about um, their they would have it less reliable um, their ability to fund these things in the future than they had in the past. And that would have been the same concern for COVID. COVID was more extreme and sudden, and then it was fixed very quickly. Um, but now is, you know, due to tightening financial conditions. But it's the same thing in that those are the only two periods since we've been doing this podcast in which financial conditions have been tight in any way. Uh, it was just briefly mm-hmm. during the COVID panic and, and now with the fed tightening at all other times, there was no concern about uh, tighter financial conditions, you know, just generally that wouldn't have been something that, that institutions would have been worried about at all. My favorite case study of how long it could take for valuations to come back to earth. And if you, buy these businesses at just insane valuations, how long it, t- it could take you to actually, you know, make money 
on the position is we've talked a lot about Microsoft, for example, right? So we could, you know, just use, of course, like the absolute peak, which somebody could say, well, who would have purchased that? I don't know. But it took you from 2000 all the way to looks like 2015. So 15 years to basically break even and actually make money. And then, of course, you know, after two, uh, 2015, the stock went up a bunch. But it's just a good illustration of how important it is to pay reasonable multiples for these businesses, right? And Microsoft's mm-hmm. a great business, okay? Um, you can look at their financials. And from 2000 onward, we have uh, from 2003 through QuickFS, look at these numbers. I mean, revenue went from $32 billion to $93 billion uh from 2003 to 2015 the stock went nowhere ebitda went from 10.9 billion to 34 billion right you could look at their cash i mean everything the business continued to grow and equity went from uh 64 billion to uh 80 billion and they paid out dividends along the way they bought back stock uh microsoft was firing on all cylinders right as a business but the stock went nowhere so it's just a good illustration to show how important it is to pay reasonable multiples for these businesses even if they're you know amazing businesses are growing fast or tech or whatever you still want to um you know keep things uh rational i would say yeah the p they're contracted from about 40 to 10 Mm -hmm. so um, so obviously over contracted, which is common. And the other thing to keep in mind in stock markets, when we talk about these things, you know, when they say, you know, Jamie Dimon says the market could go down this much or whatever. Um, the number that you get in terms of what you think would be the right price for something usually is too low on both the upside and the downside. So, um, usually things will fall, fall multiples will contract more than they should more than the average, more than normal um, in the uh, point where people are pessimistic. And then likewise, it'll it'll uh, expand to more when they're optimistic. And that's a very big part of your return, obviously, is from those uh, expansions. And, and that's a big reason why uh, a market couldn't go flat for a long period of time would have to be a contraction in multiples, um, you know. And there are some companies for which that happened, you know, from the late sixties to the early eighties or something. It's just because extreme contraction of the multiple, the the results were okay. If you were running a billion dollar fund or ten billion dollars, or let's say you just within your mandate, you were able to go absolutely anywhere. Would companies like Meta, um, Apple, Google, would those businesses start to pique your interest uh, just based on where they're currently trading uh, on a TTM basis? We have Google right here. Or Alphabet, I should say, trading mm-hmm. around 18 times EV to free cash flow, um, monster growth, obviously probably one of the best businesses in the world, at least top 10. Um, would this company, you know, start to uh, pique your interest? Would this be on uh, your close watch list? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's a very good business, but the issues are... Obviously, you know, with Alphabet, for instance, we don't know that. How do I put this? Um, I think it's a great business. I don't know if it's like a great organization or very efficient or will do good things in the future. I think it owns some properties that are very, very valuable, a couple, basically. And uh, I think the ownership of those properties is really a good thing to have. Um, you know, I don't, I think there are lots of businesses, you know, a hundred to a thousand times smaller that will have results at least as good over the last 10 years. In terms of business results, there are actually a lot that already have done that. Um, you know, uh, the, the record of like Alphabet, for instance, is not as amazing as the record of like Meta or uh, in terms of how unusual it was for a company that size to grow that fast. Um, but I don't know enough about uh, how people use these things um, to have a good idea of what their future will be, obviously, you know? So mm-hmm. people always talk about the network effects and everything, but obviously if those work in the opposite direction, then you've got a real problem. Um, Alphabet owns a couple of things that I think are very entrenched. Um, so 
th that's probably good for their future. Um, and I don't know enough about uh, what, what some other companies use. Yeah, then you look at Meta. So to your point earlier about for the first time and, you know, some time where these larger, higher quality, more predictable businesses are down just such significant amounts. Here's Meta. I mean, it's down 62% yeah. year to date. Um, I mean, that's a pretty big drawdown for a company like Meta. We could pull it up on QuickFS as well. And it's trading, you know, based on TTM numbers, assuming uh, the earnings is going to be, you know, the same or grow in the future. Uh, EV free cash flow is contract, about nine times yeah. and yeah. And then PE is 10 times. So you would think that yeah. earnings would contract. Is that based on like advertising rates and stuff like that? If we go into a recession, I think there's strong signs that online economy is going to shrink relative to offline um, in particular online advertising and some things like that. But I think that in general uh, we should expect that things like alphabet meta, Amazon, et cetera, um, do not perform as well as their peers in offline in the very near future. Um, there, there's pretty strong signs, I think, of that happening. What's the signal? I mean, that's a pretty, I would say, non-consensus view, Jeff. So where are you getting that? Well, many of them seem to have been losing market share for a year now. Um, in terms of if you look at offline companies and what their predictions are versus online ones, I think that's pretty um, clearly the case. It, it's in a variety of things. You can read companies, say, um, uh, a company that s sells direct to consumer, um, say an apparel company or something, you know, like a Nike or something. I I'm using it, actually reading it from companies, a variety of them that are, are not Nike, but but it, that's one that's easier for people to think of. Um, it sells direct to consumer, but it also sells through online and stuff. Um, you can see in their results that there's been a strong... Um, that their own direct to consumer sometimes has done okay and stores have done fine around much of the world, but that there's been a drop off in uh, purchasing behavior online. It's there's a few reasons for this. One, um, some of it is disproportionately affected by people shifting to COVID uh, behaviors um, as opposed to what they were doing before and the snapback from that. So that's just in general. Um, then two, there's also a weighting towards goods, I would say online more so than certain services that you'd consume locally and stuff. Um, that varies like, you know, Facebook gets revenue from some of those things, but some of the others don't They're they're, you know, so there would be more reliant on that. And there's a huge disproportionately weighted towards goods right now relative to what the future will be in terms of goods versus services. So services as uh, as a part of the economy is going to grow faster than goods for a while now because goods has gotten disproportionately larger than it normally would be. And it's almost certain to decline a lot. That has an effect on things like Amazon. Amazon just sells goods. Um, and so the, the economy overall, we often forget is that, I mean, it's by far mostly services is mostly domestic services mm -hmm. and so the economy can grow at six percent and your goods you know you're importing goods from china and selling them and stuff could grow really slowly um because you're not a big part of the economy and we'll barely notice it even when the economy is going strongly and you'll barely notice it so for things like amazon stuff that, that could be true um and then also and this is more complicated but especially in the advertising things and many of these companies, even like Amazon and stuff get, I, I think a reasonable amount of profit from advertising actually. Um, the, there is, and this is like 2000, I think the degree of like incestuousness is higher than people realize in terms of revenue that uh, is generated online by tech companies comes from spending of other tech companies online. Um, in a way that I think is underappreciated. So it is true that if you watch, you know, YouTube or something, you don't pay the premium thing. You might get ads for, you know, uh, Ford F-150 or whatever. Um, that's true. But you're also getting things that are unusually weighted to tech. Um, as some of these are speculative tech companies trying to grow and everything. Um, even things where we talk about cloud stuff with Amazon. I think that while they have some large customers and stuff that have nothing to do with technology, I think a, they're weighted more towards companies that ha, are fast growing, money losing startup stuff as compared to the overall economy. 
even if that's 20% of their customers or something, that's huge compared to how those things are of no significance to the overall economy. So um, I think that may be larger than people realize. I'm sure it is larger. Um, there is a, a degree to which there is a lot more spending online about online. This is true also generally in tech. I think more than people realize in terms of like spending on technology stuff, it's almost as if people think that, you know, spending for uh, IT things and stuff is like just all spending by, you know, um, Walmart and FedEx and these old economy things. It's just spread out around the economy with the same level of intensity. And a lot of times it's not. The, there's very heavy spending on technology things by other technology companies. And as you move further away from the technology part of the economy, there's less spending on that. And so that um, may affect things a lot here. Uh, and this is one area where because the last recession was a financial crisis, and so it, and it had to do with consumer stuff, um, I think... I think a lot of people may be looking more, a lot of investors may be looking too much to the experience in the financial crisis and the great recession and less so to the kinds of recessions that were pretty common after world war two in the United States, um, including 2000 and other periods um, in which it was not strongly a consumer led recession. And uh, it would be easy to um, overestimate, um, how well business spending on stuff, advertising, CapEx, tech spending on things will hold up relative to the economy. Um, those things are pretty easy to cut and cut by a lot uh, in a way that consumer stuff is not. The consumer things are much more resilient. Um, and this stuff is much more cyclical than people think. So I just, you know, the whole period in which tech is growing, these companies are growing so big and everything, was a period in which there was some expansion in the economy. They grew faster than the economy, but there just wasn't contraction. So people aren't used to what contraction looks like. Um, you know, I mean, it ha was very short, but you might remember there was, they saw pretty serious contraction once they realized COVID was happening. Yeah, like absolutely. Like instantaneous, you know. So um, I just think... I, you know, I, these are huge companies. Um, I, I don't, don't just mean in terms of market cap and stuff. I mean, in terms of their actual um, amount of advertising that they have, they're, they're now giant um, in terms of the overall advertising spend in the United States with things like Facebook. Um, I mean, meta, you know, generally, and they will be affected by these things that happen in the economy. So will see but i think that the some offline things may hold up better than online um i, I wouldn't be surprised if the eventual trend is that covid had you know no effect on a lot of spending versus trend of what is done online versus offline so that will be back on the same trend line um in a few years why do you Which think that is i don't think it changed people's behavior I think change people's behavior around work and some things related to that. I think in general, it, it didn't have a large change in people's behavior. Um, I don't expect My thesis it on it is if, you know, because I do agree with you, I do think it changed things on work. I think people will want to get out more and go to the store and, uh, you know, get out and do things in person because more people are working from home now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that is a definite possibility. Um it's, I will see, but I just think that some of these things, I'm not predicting some huge decline in these things. I'm just saying that the expectation that they will definitely in the short term grow faster, online stuff will grow faster than offline. I think there, we shouldn't assume that that's the case. I think it's very possible that online will, will contract um, more rapidly or not grow during a period of a recession, if there's one now or will be one soon that has recession business spending, advertising, things like that. Um, and part of that is there may be more marginal stuff that's in the tech things that we're talking about, the online stuff. Um, it depends. Some of it isn't, but I just think that there is more of it there. Um, 
you know, there is a fair amount of spending by like, del- you know, we're talking about people's behavior changing by like delivery companies and, you know, gig economy things that lose a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, a money losing enterprise in tighter financial conditions, it's hard to assume that they'll increase their ad budget over time. You shouldn't necessarily assume that their ad budget will be as resilient as um, some other kinds of, a, of companies. So, you know, it, it, you can if you have more ad stuff coming from delivery, things like that versus, say, Domino's or something, might the ad budget decline more on that? I think it might. Yeah, I mean, you remember when financial conditions tightened at the beginning of the year and Uber sent out a memo to all of their employees that got leaked, basically saying, hey, like, it's all about free cash flow now. Past markets are gone. It's all about generating cash and excess cash. Sure. So, I mean, from the earnings perspective, the reason why I think earnings is likely to contract at some things, you know, it seems really likely that it would contract at something like um, Meta, is that we know... It's kind of like when we talked about universal insurance or something. I said, you know, we know to a certain extent what they set their premiums at before. We can look at like premiums written and stuff like that. And so we kind of have an idea of what the combined ratio will be in the future. You need to raise it um, fast enough. And then, you know, Buffett talks about this in his letters to the 70s and 80s of kind of looking ahead and saying, here's what I think the combined ratio will be next year. It's not that he's psychic or something. It's that insurance has a lag there. Um, The issue with these tech companies in general is that their expenses they can't just shut off the expense growth that they were having. So the reason why you're probably seeing things like, you know, stop traveling, stop doing this, stop doing that is because they were bringing on too many people um, relative to where they're seeing their uh, growth decelerate too. Um, For other companies, they have much slower growth. So they're much more used to this and they do not suddenly hire a lot of people. It's similar to what we saw with inventories. Right. With some Mm -hmm. companies where we said, look at these companies that have inventories up 40 percent. What went wrong? What were they thinking? Um, Same sort of thing here. What were they thinking in terms of increasing the number of people as much as they did? Um, You know, if I think that the trend isn't that different from what it was before COVID, which I don't think it will be, then you have to slow down your hiring. Or you have to fire people um, and you have to do that now. These are incredibly profitable companies with great capital positions. So if it wasn't for them being public companies that care about what they report and care about their stock price, uh, you know, you could get right back on the trend that you should be on over a few years by slowing things down reasonably and not, I mean, you don't need to go through actually firing a lot of people and stuff. Um, They may do more dramatic cost cutting because they care about what they report. Um, but you know, if this was a private company or something, I'm not sure that they would necessarily look at it that way. They're, you know, they're, they're not in any danger of having to do that. I mean, it honestly doesn't matter if meta reports, no earnings for a couple of years, it's got, it's doing fine in terms of the free cash flow. It normally generates cash, lack of liabilities, you know, very solid Mm -hmm. company. And so it wouldn't even matter if they had cratering earnings reported for a little while, just because they had to grow into their, um, employee structure and stuff. Theirs is a little different because obviously the story there, right, is, yeah. you know, allegedly that they're losing huge amounts of um, 10 billion of of of, of um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course. But what I was going to say is that the expectations that they're losing huge amounts of um, attention to things like TikTok and stuff, you know, so so huge differences that way. And then also, you know, supposedly advertising is less effective there. Uh, that might be true. I don't know uh, what probably is true is a really big problem here. We've talked about this with Twitter and stuff. The issue is a lot of times people value things on like the eyeballs, right? The story of meta to a large extent is not really that it was very successful in getting a lot of um, people to use its products for a really long time, although it has been successful that way, but that its advertising has been incredibly effective. I never would have predicted that. And so I never could have seen the growth to levels it did because if it's advertising effectiveness, was getting you returns on your spending more similar to Twitter, this company would not, I mean, it'd be making money. It'd be an impressive company, but it would never have become the huge, one of the big fanged stocks that it is. It's because of how effective advertising on Facebook was. Um, And so even if it retains everyone within its uh, family of, you know, apps, um, but is more shorter form content, 
Um, I, it's unlikely that the advertising would ever be as successful. So, you know, I mean, it's sort of like, um, say newspapers, right? If you have, if you have um, classified advertising was incredibly profitable. Uh, ads that were run directly in the paper printed in them w- were very profitable too. Uh, advertising that was added, uh, inserted into the paper, um, you know, as a separate uh, print um, was less effective. And so it's the same number of people reading it, no matter what you do, but you mm-hmm. have different profit on each of it because of how effective it is and how much people are willing to pay for it. So um, if you all, ha- if your advertising is hundred percent inserts in your newspaper, um, that's obviously a lot less profitable than having some big classified section or having a lot of um, advertising in line um, in the actual paper. So that's a problem here. You know, if everyone goes to consuming things in a more, TikTok way than in a uh, Facebook way, um, I, you know, this it's just advertising won't be worth as much. There won't be as much pie for people to uh, consume that way because presumably TikTok loses a lot of money and stuff. Um, you know, I, I don't you ever know. Use TikTok? No, never. Have you ever seen somebody use TikTok? Yes. It's pretty scary. I mean, it's like one or two seconds. Boom. They don't like it. Next video. Yeah. Boom. And they just do that for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, I mean, I read a couple books on TikTok, like I said, I, they were mediocre books, but I, it was very, very interesting. Um, the basic idea that I came away with that I thought was very, very interesting is it flips everything on its head of we have this low quality content. How do we find the people who it's worth something to? That's basically what they came up with is not we have an audience. Let's figure out what content to give them. But no matter what the content is, no matter how strange, low quality, whatever, we can find who this will appeal to. And if we match that up perfectly, then we're going to really consume people's attention and hold it. And that's absolutely true because, you know, when we talk about movies or anything like that or whatever, you know, what's the most important thing. It's just the question of, for an individual there, it's the question of whether uh, the content is exactly what you're looking for. It's not the quality. It's not the whatever of it. It's like, if this is the particular infinitesimal niche that you're really into, then this will hold your attention, you know? Um, And that's always been a problem for broadcast things, for entertainment things. They are a general audience thing. So anything that had scale had to play to a general audience. Now you have things first with other stuff, but then it became, you know, TikTok is a more extreme example of that, but this was true even with Facebook and YouTube things. Um, You had scale in terms of the overall um, business of what you had while actually not having to play to a general audience. You know, you were there were silos inside of what you had where each person, each uh, ecosystem, you know, was sort of experiencing completely different worlds inside your media outlet. So you could have tons of content that was playing to particular groups and stuff. And it didn't have to be something that worked for the general um, public to be kind of the way that it would on broadcast TV or a Hollywood movie or whatever. And that that's really important. Um, it, it's kind of niche, but it was able to do niche in a um, huge way in terms of scale business wise without having to have content that's super popular um, in terms of everyone watching the exact same thing. So it's very interesting that way. I don't know that it'll ever be as valuable from an advertising perspective, like on a per ad shown, um, you know, per eyeball sort of thing. I don't think so. So since we're talking about larger companies, we could uh, circle back on Cinemark Holdings. Do you have any thoughts on where it's currently trading at its valuation? It looks like we're back to, um, you know, we <laughs> hit a low in COVID 2020. Yeah. yeah, COVID lows and yeah. uh, 2008 lows, basically. Um, right. I think it's been cheaper. Crisis. Yeah, the only time I think it's been cheaper is probably later in 2020. Like after things didn't, you know, really open back up successfully and everything. In the actual moment of COVID, I don't even think it was this cheap. Um, yeah, Cinemark is interesting. Um, this is one that like, if you wanted to trade it or something, you probably would have been successful because what surprised me, if you look at the stock price chart, I guess, if we can look at this year, um, yeah. So what surprised me is actually it, it matches up really well with the release schedule the strength of the release schedule. So I would have thought that you would not have had, you know, so um, 
that at the moment, it, it, the stock peaks and then starts declining almost at the exact moment in which the um, quality of films coming out drop to nothing. Um, you know, th- they, we've rarely ever had uh, such a poorly um, supplied box office as we have right now. And that's been true for a while. And yet the supply of movies to the box office was pretty good uh, through the beginning, of, th- through sort of early part of the summer. Um, and then things are still playing, but new releases did not continue into the, you know, it was shorter than normal that way. Um, and it looks like, you know, obviously um, we've got a couple big movies coming out and literally just a couple um, the rest of this year. And we know what the release schedule is for next year and uh, it suffers from the same problem as this year. It, it seems a little too loaded into particular times of the year. There'll be particular weak parts. And in general, you're going to have a weak rest of this year. Um, we don't know how big certain movies will be, but the the drop off in the box office is really big, but it's because of a drop off in the kinds of movies um, to give you an idea. I've talked about the website, the numbers that's T H E a dash and then numbers.com. Um, that's a good one to look at for uh, box office data. It does predict projections uh, each weekend and all of that. And you have an idea of how these models work. Um, at one point, their adjustment for COVID would have been to reduce the expected box office for a movie by about 10%. The opening and the venture box office both by about 10% from what it would have done prior to COVID. Now the model, uh, not adjusted by a human, but what the model thinks is that the adjustment should be like 50%. The 90% may have always been uh, too aggressive. Um, but the 50% is also definitely is, you know, definitely way too conservative that the market is, is half of what it used to be. Um, the reason for that is that something's going on where the quality of the movies, uh, it, the, you know, the quality, when I say quality, I mean like the, uh, the, the audience appeal of the movies, uh, is very different from what it was earlier. I don't think that Top Gun Maverick would ever have made a dollar more if there hadn't been COVID. I think it did what it was ever going to do. Um, I don't think that, uh, Spider-Man, uh, No Way Home, um, did any worse than it was would have done before COVID, and even some other movies uh, did what we would have expected. Um, you know, so so like using the same star for a different movie, um, Uncharted. You know, I, I think it would have done about the same thing. So, but those are kinds of releases that are different from what we've been seeing lately. I also don't think horror movies have been doing really different numbers than were expected. Some things have had dramatic. Se- seemingly, I mean, it's hard to judge the quality stuff because you only have a an idea of like exact. Some movies don't hit exactly with people the way that you'd expect. Some are surprisingly bigger hits than you'd think, um, and you'd have to judge each movie differently. It's not a pure commodity, but it does seem there's something going on with like um, uh, mid sized movies that aren't the biggest budget movies, aren't the lowest budget either. So horror things are usually very low budget. Um, relative to the size of the box office they can expect. And then, you know, um, superheroes and things are very high budget. Um, the in-between ones are your thrillers and your romantic comedies and things. Certainly stuff like that has not done that well. Like, I don't, I mean, at this point, there's like no market for romantic movies. Um, and that might be affected by gender, age, things like that. Um, but it doesn't make much sense because we're obviously talking about some sort of change in people's behavior. It can't really be that people are all that concerned about COVID. I mean, if people were very concerned about it, then presumably they'd have their booster and their latest, you know, whatever stuff. And um, given that, and then if they got it, they treat it. The risks are really low now. Um, so that doesn't seem like a realistic concern that it's an actual health concern anymore. Um, so, it, so what does that tell you? That they, that they prefer watching it at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, the window shorter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may be, you know, like I said, there may be gender issues there too. Maybe Can more you explain like the they, window for people that aren't familiar with it? Right. So how long the movie is in theaters before it's available to be bought at home or uh, to be seen in some sort of pay TV window or something. Um, 
historically what it was is um, for decades, it would have meant it comes out on video cassette or on DVD or Blu-ray. Um, and then after that, it would have a pay TV window, which in the United States would be something like an HBO or something like that. Um, so literally something that you pay for Netflix um, would be would have it um, because of the changes. Now, we're often talking about it appearing on things like Pe- Peacock, uh, P- Paramount, um, Disney Plus and um, HBO Max. Um, so some things I think people expect to appear there and they are happy to see them then. Um, and I think that's had an effect on some stuff. Uh, so for instance, it's showing you here, like Lyle, Lyle, Crocodile didn't do that well, but family things have done okay. Considering how quickly they're putting them out on video, uh, how quickly they're putting them out so that you can watch them on something like a, um, at the Disney or universal or whatever is, is during the pandemic was putting them out very fast. Um, so you'd think that those might not do that well, but there were things like, uh, a sequel to sing and, and a sequel to um, despicable me and some things like that, that, you know, did perfectly well. So it, it really does seem to be certain groups um, that are affected more. And I'm not sure exactly what that's all about. And also a certain way of, of thinking about it, of why you're going to the movies and everything. So the big budget uh, spectacle stuff seems to be doing fine. Horror stuff seems to be doing fine. Family stuff, maybe. Um, but anything, especially that seems to, uh, depend on any audience that is uh, has a big female component, and especially a big female component that isn't particularly young, I think has been really weaker than I would have expected. So that might be some sort of preference thing. So if you were framing an investment in Cinemark today, what are some things that you would be thinking about, right? Um, it sounds like you think customer behavior has changed. Um, mm-hmm. You had said that you think the business has it been cheaper since, I mean, other than, you know, 2008 and 2020, we're probably cheaper than where it was at uh, in 2020. They do have uh, more debt now than they had uh, at the beginning of COVID or end of 2019. Mm -hmm. So would you be steering clear from Cinemark because you don't feel certain about, you know, where this could be going over the next 10 years? Or what would you be thinking? No. I wouldn't steer clear of it. I mean, the the price is very attractive. Uh, if you look, you know, if they don't even have to get back to peak sales to have an uh, an EV to sales that's about one or something, they're pretty close to that. Um, uh, so obviously, price to sales is way below that. Um, uh, their price, their market cap is way below what their peak sales were. Um, it it's highly leveraged. And so I'd warn people about that. It's highly leveraged both from a financial perspective in that it has debt, but it's also very highly leveraged from an operating perspective, as you can see. You can see that just from the idea that gross profit is you know, in the 60s and EBIT is in the teens, that um, you have a very big gap that depends on the volume of people attending your movies. They will report good results when there's plenty of box office to be had, and they'll report bad results when there isn't. Um, you know, it is a volume based business. So I think it's improved a lot in terms of how much they've made per customer and all of that. But there's not a lot you can do about that if you have um, weak box office slate. Um, I do think that the poor results in box office the second half of this year have been the result of the the movies, the release schedule. Um, and I think that's not something to get worked up about one way or the other. I'm kind of surprised to some extent how much the... Um, how much people think about that, you know, what it reported in results kind of independent of what movies were out there. The question is really whether those movies are coming in close to what they would have done outside of the pandemic. Um, and the other question is whether the supply of movies will be affected. That is that P- that studios behavior will really change. I'm most concerned with studio behavior possibly changing. And I am surprised to some extent how willing studios are still to consider kind of funding their online stuff with um, giving up a lot of gains in releasing to the box office in the best way that would make the most money that way. And aftermarket, um, you know, after theatrical market, um, making money from that too. It's very expensive to put this stuff 
exclusively to your streaming services and to do it quickly and everything, you're losing out on huge amounts of money, not just in terms of box office that you bring in where they bring in usually about half of what you see in the box office goes to the studio. Um, but in addition to that, you also would be playing these things on TV and um, have other sales that would be bringing in quite a lot of money. Um, you know, if Disney is p putting on their own service and not giving it even for a brief period to, um, you know, a Netflix or something like that, that's, you know, depending on the movie, but for a huge movie, uh, that can be tens of millions of dollars. Um, you know, even a run on pay TV. Um, so like um, premium cable or something showing a blockbuster movie at times was, you know, 10 or $20 million um, was probably the fee that was paid for that, for the top 10 movies or so of the year. Um, and various studios have a couple of those. So it's a ton of money. I mean, this is effectively like putting in a huge amount of CapEx into things that you, that, you know, Disney, HBO, whatever, don't expect to be profitable for a couple of years. And, you know, I don't know if the stocks, are rewarding in the same way as before investors are rewarding in the same way. Um, you know, growing your, your, um, online business as much, you know, so it's a, it's a decision to make, but it, it might've made a lot of sense when interest rates were near zero and everyone was paying a lot for future growth in that area and poor results right now in your theatrical. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure that they seriously considered paramount, maybe we don't release Maverick, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, in a box office setting. There was probably a moment where they thought about that. Uh, I don't know how high a percentage chance there was of that, but if there's any percentage chance of that, that was a very, very valuable movie to them when it was released in terms of what it brought in. And Paramount's not a few like that. And your results will look a lot worse if you have no movies released like that. They've actually made a bunch of money theatrically. And I agree. I think it also pigeonholes himself from like an awareness perspective for like the brand, right? So Top Gun, there's a brand there uh, for future sequels and stuff if they want to, um, you know, do that. Why do you think they are um, more reluctant to release them through the theaters? Do you think it's really purely the multiples that streaming companies are going through? So really just trying to build that online streaming business and then you get that multiple that, uh, you know, was typical in uh, 2018, 1920, uh, 2021. I mean, do you really think that's the prime motivating factor? I, I guess I, I think for some reason, I, and I don't get this exactly. Investors really like the recurring revenue idea, right? Recurring revenue. Um, and I don't really get that in some of these cases because a Marvel movie has recurring revenue. The James Bond movie has recurring revenue. Um, if every few years you put one of these out, you divide it up by the number of years you're putting out and everything, it has value. And it has that value whether you're collecting it monthly from people, uh, putting it up in a library and then saying, okay, so what's the cost of this overall? And then what are they paying me for this library? Versus people are coming to the theaters. But I don't think there, there should be, I don't think it's realistic to have this terrible fear that the next Spider-Man will come out and, uh, you know, it'll come in the box office 70% lower than, um, the series normally does people will come to to see it and so it has recurring revenue when you can put it out and i don't see the mathematical difference between that and um the, the monthly stuff that you um collect from having a, a library up there so I, I don't get it to a certain extent on that i think that they also har harm themselves by competing against each other if you release at the same time, which because of COVID they did, trying to outgrow each other. This is a different one where, I, you know, I just have a difference of opinion here. I don't think there's ever going to be just one of these. So I think it's stupid to get worried about whether Netflix had a lead over uh, Disney Plus or Disney Plus will catch up or what. It, I mean, I think they're headed to the same place. Either you have scale or you don't. And it's a realistic concern for a, a Paramount or a um, Peacock or something. But, you know if over time you invest enough in it to grow it, you just, you know, if, if you're one of the top five or six services or whatever that everyone's going to have, then what does it matter if you got there really fast or not? Um, I, I don't get it. You, you lose a bunch of money by doing it, you know, um, by trying to be the first one there. And I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any difference to it. I mean, is Disney plus 
Um, is it harder for them to attract people because people already have Netflix? Can they charge less for it? Because, you know, I mean, I don't see how you're harmed by the fact that Netflix got there first. I really don't. Um, so do you, do you think from Disney Plus's perspective, they're like, hey, actually, this is just an untapped market for us. There's potential here because they have that backlog. Well, I also think it's a good. No, I think it's a great use of your library mm-hmm. and and they've created tv shows off of things and and um re-release movie uh, have done um remakes of movies sort of things that that makes sense for where you would put it um it's a great place to put sort of a tired so a series that wouldn't get a sequel probably you know uh they did uh like a another hocus pocus or something so that's a movie that's you know well liked enough in the way that like there were you know um some people are familiar with it and it has some fondness for people of certain generation, but it's not a realistic movie to have released as a Hollywood movie uh, today in terms of it wouldn't be safe to release it mm-hmm. to not expect you could lose a lot of money. You could. So um, doing things like that would make sense. Or if you're starting to see that some of your remakes of your, your live action versus uh, things that you were doing of your um, animated classics, you know, they had a Pinocchio one that they did and stuff like that. If some of those are borderline in terms of whether you're going to release them in theaters or not, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the ones that are riskier, like um, Pixar, you know, like they've released a lot of movies now to streaming with not a huge amount made in box office. Um, so does that change the brand over time and stuff? Um, it might. I, I, I think it's a really good use of their library and i think that having a bunch of um tv series and old movies and things on there is very helpful and they get more out of it than they ever would have any other way uh i'm not so sure about trying to attract people to the service in the first place by doing this because also then you get churned you get a lot of people that quit because they were brought in for that one thing you know Mm -hmm. um so the, the one that was most questionable that way i think was warner brothers but I think they may change their strategy and stuff like that. They certainly changed management and things. But that was the one that was most questionable, what exactly you're doing with that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And um, I think the um, movie theater, like like Cinemark, for instance, is way cheaper relative to its future prospects than some of the entertainment companies, you know, the studios and stuff they're very heavily leveraged. Some of the other ones, you know, cause, cause you could invest in, um, uh, Warner now, uh, Warner discovery, or you could, um, Paramount. Um, they're, you know, much more sort of plays on that studio as opposed to like, uh, Walt Disney, which is, a, has a lot of other assets too. Um, th- they are not super cheap. I would say, like when you count in all the debt and all the things um, versus their prospects for the future. I don't know that they, that, that the studio business has like a lot better prospects than the movie theater business. Um, so I know it attracts a lot of value investors that way, but I, I would seriously say, look at things like Cinemark um, even more so than you might look at, um, you know, Paramount and Warren discovery and stuff like that. Um, uh, just because your, your price is a lot better. The tough part though, for me with like saying, okay, Cinemark's a good stock to buy. Is there stocks like Six Flags, for instance, that have a pretty mm-hmm. similar um, riskiness in terms of like leverage and stuff, but probably higher degree of predictability in terms it almost of looks customer exact behavior same. over time. Yeah. Yeah. $1.5 um, billion dollar market cap to a $3.7 billion EV. Is that literally not, I mean... It's got to be pretty mm-hmm. close to what uh, Cinemark was. Cinemark is one point yeah. three billion uh, market cap to uh, three point one billion dollar enterprise value. So pretty close. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think probably the future there is easier to to predict and stuff. Um, you know, I think right before COVID, Six Flags was under uh, was probably you know underspending on capex. Cinemark is probably overspending on capex. So you know, the, the free cash flow thing is a little bit, uh, favors, maybe looks, makes six flags look more attractive than it is or whatever. But, um, 
they have changed how they're running things. They have a, you know, like we talked about a new CEO in there and they have a new strategy, which is not to run things by like paying out everything in dividends and everything. Um, so if they achieve the goals that the targets that they're talking about, then obviously it's a very attractive stock. Um, so that's the one that's hard for me is like, would I pick something like a Cinemark over something like a Six Flags? I don't know about that. Obviously, there might be some concern in both cases about um, like a recession um, and uh, and also debt. And, you know, so, you know, it's, this isn't helping either way, this kind of um, environment for them. So that might have their stock down a lot in the short term, both Six Flags mm-hmm. and Cinemark. I think it's overdone. I don't think that that's actually you know, recessions are a huge factor for those industries. It's hard looking at studying past recessions. It's hard to actually find much of a decline in attendance um, due to recession in either movie um, going or uh, in regional theme parks. I mean, you can see it in, in like a, a Disney world or something, but it's really hard to see much of it in uh, either attendance at like a six flags or cinemark. So I don't know that the economy actually would affect their, attendance levels got it cool well uh we could hop over to our monthly q a podcast um uh, and when i say monthly we actually didn't do one last month uh last okay. time we did a q a was two months ago because we did a snap judgment last month but uh be on the lookout for future ones i think it's good to do once a month um uh, reach out or you could follow me on twitter at focused compound and we'll just bank through as many as possible um, somebody asked, what is the biggest concern slash issue for banks right now? What characteristics of a bank will make them a stronger business in the current environment as opposed to their peers? Um, the biggest concern now is a mismatch between asset and liability duration. So, um, relying on, uh, short-term, um, money market type, uh, funding basically, you know, that it's, um, Overnight money, CDs, uh, one-year borrowings, whatever. Um, that kind of reprice faster than your assets, where you might have assets that um, the yields on them don't reprice that much. So like having a ton of loans on one side of your balance sheet and um, having a lot of short-term um, money on the other. I, when I say short-term stuff, though, I do mean that like... Um, I think that, you know, when we talk about frost or something like that, they're like entirely on short-term stuff. Um, in the book, Capital Allocation, uh, they talk a little bit about how the way that um, the Rockford Bank was run is safer to rely on um, time deposits. Um, I don't know that I entirely agree with that. I think that the safest thing and what would make a bank the strongest in this environment would be customer deposits from actual households and businesses who believe you're providing them with some sorts of services and things beyond just providing them with yield, because I think that will help you the most in um, retaining them and in having uh, large spreads. Mm -hmm. So like the leeway of what you actually pay on their deposits. Mm -hmm. So Frost actually raised their rates faster than the big banks that they compete with and stuff, but it's such a small amount versus, um, what the yields are that you could get. And it's very valuable in terms of keeping the customer because then uh, it's hard to, you know, acquire customers a significant cost with that. So I think I would, you know, a lot of core deposits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Is what you want to have because you don't really have to pay fed funds types um, rates to people to keep them at your bank. Mm hmm. What are the biggest risks slash concerns for auto dealerships right now? That was another question he had. That's a good question. A lot of people have the big concern that they would have, um, that they would take losses on their inventory, you know, because like used car pricing would be down between the time when they buy and the time when they sell. I mean, it's possible if you had a lot of debt financing that and a lot of them do which is sort of like trade debt they may show it as but what they're doing is they're borrowing on the uh, inventory on their floor um so if that happens and say you're borrowing at a high percentage of it then when you sell um 
the car at a worse price than you were expecting because used car prices fall, let's say, um, you really don't generate any cash flow because it goes uh, completely to paying off the debt, right? Because if you're if you're borrowing, you know, eighty percent or whatever the value of the car, and you don't generate much more than that, um, then then you don't generate anything from that. So. I, I guess that's what people would be concerned about. Um, I, I don't know if uh, there's as much that I'd be worried about for auto dealerships now. Um, auto dealerships are complicated because in some cases we're talking about things that have a financing aspect to them and stuff. When we're talking about things that have a financing aspect to it, um, CarMart, which is a stock we talk about a lot, CarMax, mm-hmm. which was a stock that's more like in the news and everything. Um, those are, it's different. And I would say that for the financing perspective of it, uh, it's the unaffordability that's really, really difficult. Mm-hmm. So it, that is really hard from a financing perspective because then you have to go out longer on the loan. There's more possibility of eventual losses on this thing and stuff. So you, you have, we've always talked about that with the, like, the duration of how long this thing could be, how low the, the down payment is initially and how far out this loan is going to go because you're trying to size the 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 if the paycheck is only up five percent or whatever over last year then you're trying to size it so that it's the same percentage increase versus what the paycheck was before that that your customers had and uh, obviously the, the cars with the combination of interest rates and the actual prices of the cars went up a lot more than that same situation you have in like housing or something but i think different from that it's really um an issue for the financing side of it. So they have to be careful on that. Um, but that's a much longer term trend. It's just been greatly exacerbated right now, but I think it's something to be, to be really careful about from a financing perspective. Um, but different dealerships, like sometimes that's that what you're looking at doesn't have a financing aspect that's kept on their own business, you know? So that's Mm -hmm. not really the business they're in. They're not generating things. Although financing still had, there's an aspect of it in terms of determining volumes. Next question, any possibility of looking more at overseas names given the dollar's insane current strength? Yes. I'm looking at UK things, um, Japanese things, some Nordic things. Um, and those are currencies that used to be pretty strong against the dollar sometimes. And now I, it, other things equal if I could find the exact same um, value and quality and whatever and you know uh confidence in it and it was in one of those other countries not the u.s you know in a different currency i would rather buy it uh with earnings in the other currency yeah more on that somebody because sometimes people send me dm somebody had said hey bud i'd be interested if any european stocks around jeff's radar or popping up on jeff's radar no need to name names just generally if the weakness has created any possible opportunities yes i'd say yes yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. and we did a podcast mm-hmm. on like UK stocks where we talked a little bit more about that, uh, which was the last podcast that was uploaded. But so yeah, you definitely are seeing more opportunities uh, today than you have in recent memory overseas. Definitely, yes. I mean, there there's some countries. I mean, we talked about them with the UK and stuff. But there's some countries mm-hmm. where you know, even though yields are up and stuff, the dividend yield on some stocks is not bad and everything. And if you're getting in a different currency. I think it's not a bad way to diversify away from being all in dollars and everything. I, you know, I, I think it's fine. I don't think mm-hmm. you should be an American investor and put a hundred percent overseas, but I think if you see things that you like that you would buy if they were U S companies and now they're in other countries and, you know, on a purchasing power parity basis, it looks like your currency's kind of pricey and these other currencies are cheaper versus it. I think it would be good to, you know, maybe you will make money on the currency over time. Got it. Uh, Trey asks, can you talk a little bit about how investors should think about hurdle rates as interest rates rise and perhaps reach a new non-zero plateau? I know Jeff doesn't necessarily change his, but many investors do. Yeah. So a lot of people ask questions about this. I did a study about um, going back 15 years or something about um, normalized P ratios. I was trying to do a thing sort of like the CAPE ratio, the Schiller PE, which I use a different method to do the same thing. And people always ask about that. I always ask about the alternative of like bond yields versus stocks. There is very little evidence that I can find that there is a consistent relationship over time between the fact that there are alternatives in terms of yields that are competitive with stocks. So in other words, uh, there are times where stocks are very cheap and yet bonds are incredibly expensive, uh, long-term bonds. 
government bonds, like so let's say the ten-year treasury or you know long-term corporate bonds. Um, what there is a so you know about half the time they both seem to work out that they're both expensive or they're both cheap at extremes, but the other half of the time it seems completely that that's not the case. Um, bonds were not incredibly expensive in two thousand when stocks were. They look pretty normal. Um, it, you know, no one would have said, "Oh, these these you really um, have incredibly low yields." Uh, in the forties, stocks had a period where they were um, fairly cheap, though not the cheapest they'd ever be or anything. But bonds were some of the most expensive they'd ever be, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But in certain periods, like now, we're seeing huge correlation between them. And in like the early eighties, when you had the same thing. Um, you saw a really strong relationship. I think people think the hurdle rate thing is driving um, an opportunity cost between like long-term bonds, 10-year treasury or whatever, and stocks. I think the evidence in real life is that uh, we see this relationship when it has to do with short-term, like overnight type money. Uh, Tight money, is bad for asset prices of many things, including stocks and bonds, both uh, loose is good for both of them. And uh, when we see more indeterminate, we can't really tell if it's uh, exceptionally tight or, ex- or not. Sometimes we have bubbles in one or the other. We tend not to have bubbles in both or, you know, booms or busts in, in, in both assets at the same time. So everyone does this, the, the discount rates and all that stuff um, adjusting with the interest rates. I don't really see it. Um, in terms of the past history, I think the f- the feeling that you have now in terms of stocks dropping and everything is much more tied to the Fed funds rate generally, of, I mean, specifically, but financial conditions generally, the difficulty of, um, of uh, having short-term money easily accessible at nearly free rates. Um, that's what I think it's more of rather than competitiveness, competitiveness with bonds. Um, obviously if stocks were really unattractive versus, um, purchases that you could make of like debt to have reasonable yields, then there would be nothing wrong with, um, buying bonds on that basis. I don't see them as that competitive in any place I look around, you know, uh, stocks are the better bet long-term for, for one thing, they offer more inflation protection. It's not great, but it's more. Um, so I, I, it, it doesn't really change things for me. I think obviously cash is much more attractive now, right? Cause you have some yield on cash and, um, but you know, cash would have been a good place to be before the rate started rising. Right. Even though it, it yielded nothing at the time, it held up better than some other things. So, um, I, I think people talk about it by comparing off of the bond yields and stuff, but I think you'll see pretty quickly that um, it doesn't, you know, it's not really reflecting a DCF type thing. If, if we had, if it took a while for long-term yields to drop, but money got very easy, I think you'd, you'd notice a difference in stock prices pretty fast. So how do you think investors should think about hurdle rates, right? From your own perspective, you tend to think about it based on your past returns. Yeah, I do. I think you should generally choose between cash and assets that you think you can get good returns in. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think that you should overpay for any asset, but you should try to be in the asset. uh, Overpay, like statistically, you're way out of line with what you should normally be in. But stocks have such a large advantage over other assets, um, especially some other assets, especially um, if you're able to add some value over time in the way that you pick them and stuff. so that's how I think. So yeah, if if say I think that I can make 10% a year normally um, in pretty plain uh, stocks that aren't particularly good ideas or particularly bad or whatever, but just stuff that you can find almost all the time, uh, then I would not want to buy a stock that I didn't see that 10% potential in and I would want to hold cash. It's hard though, because you know when you're investing other people's money and everything, you know, in general, some people are pretty understanding of it and stuff, but in general, you know, they can hold cash on their own. So they're giving you money because they would like to see it invested in some way. Um, yeah. So we got another question on free cash flow plus growth. Um, uh, this person says, when Jeff says that if my hurdle rate is of 
10%, and the free cash flow yield is of 5% a year, I would need growth of 5% a year to reach it. I don't see how this works out to a CAGR of 15% during the period. How should I calculate it on Excel and see it? Well, Jeff actually uh, did a recent blog post, free cash flow plus growth. Isn't it just double counting? And he went in right. to like more of the math <laughs> behind it. Um, it was a great blog post. This is one of the most... See what I mean, Jeff, you've tried laying out like a simple framework yeah. for people to think about. It. I think this is one of the most common questions that we get asked. Yeah. So basically I talk about it and what I'm saying is uh, all these calculations that people do where they say, well, free cash flow plus growth might not work because when I try to put it in Excel, it doesn't work this way. Something is missing. Something is leaking from your uh, Excel sheet here in that a cash flow has to turn into something. So it has to be either a dividend yield or it's going to buy back stock or it's going to build up on the balance sheet you're inadvertently making an assumption that like if a company let's use an ex, you know example like you know NACO was spun off and people say okay so what if it never you know trades at a better price or something well th that's totally justified if i'm if i'm wrong and it didn't generate free cash flow in the years that you owned it you know but if it generates like you know say it's it's earning like $5 a share and it's spun off at like 30 or something over a period of 5 years or 6 years um if it earned that in free cash flow let's say which, so this is not what actually happened. But if that was in free cash flow every year, um, then, the, then the EV would drop to like zero if they didn't do anything with it. Literally, the market would have to say that cash is not worth anything. If they paid it all out in dividends, well, would the stock really have a 15% dividend yield all the time? If they acquired something, well, then it would show some growth. It would whatever, you know. So m my point is just um, it's theoretically possible, sure, um, but the problem that you're having is with this is that you have to think that the cash flow has to turn into something. That's the Buffett idea of the market value test. It goes into something. And I get into a little bit of that discussing it with like a company that has earnings, but not free cash flow. What happens there? And there you can go into inventory receivables, things like that. But here it can, if it's free cash flow, it, it you know, it can't go into those things. So um, that's basically the answer. And yes, the, the the problem that people have, I guess, you know, one issue with that is mathematically they want to say, well, which is it going to be? I want to model it. So do I model it that they buy back all their stock? Do I model they pay it all out in dividends? Do I model it builds up on the balance sheet? I model it acquires stuff, pays down debt. And the answer is I don't know what it's going to do of those <laughs> things, to be honest. We can guess and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, in the case Based of on what NACO, they've done we, in the past, right? Right. So like in the case of NACO, it was really big. Well, we hope they don't reinvest in coal. But other than that, we kind of assume that each dollar that it retains will be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of like a dollar or something. And even if it turned out to be worth about 50 cents, still that wouldn't make the stock expensive. So you build in that margin of safety and, and you do it that way. Um, the answer is that the, the cash flow turns into some sort of actual asset or something. It has to. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be used eventually. So um, it, this is part of a bigger thing that I don't explain well enough. Um, but a lot of this... Uh, confusion or things about well does this approach work does that approach work comes down to this idea of asset earnings equivalence you whatever ideas you have in investing about you know value investing or whatever your idea has to make sense if you turn it from a flow number a um you know an earnings number a cash flow number whatever um a yield number to an asset number so if you have this idea that you know some land in macau or whatever is worth um, some number that's fine, but if it turns out that's a cap rate of one percent, you can't turn you can't turn it back into earnings, right? And so you have this mm -hmm. really you say there's this huge discount to asset value, but I can't turn it back into earnings. Sometimes the same thing happens going the other way with people, where they say, well, the P is low, but the P is always going to be low and everything. But but that doesn't really make sense unless the quality of the E is poor in a sense in which it's badly allocated, in which it isn't generated in cash. Things like that. So um, a stock trading IP of six, you know, that might make sense for a textile company that it all has to go into inventory every year for a steel plant that it all has to go into PP&E and you have continually uh, declining return on invested capital or something. But it's really hard to understand how uh, that argument that there's like this value gap that will never close if it's a cash flow. Um, and, and that's the other part of it is that I, I do want to stress, I've never said like it's earnings plus growth. It is a hundred percent, not earnings plus growth. Mm -hmm. Um, most companies historically, 
retain at least half of their earnings to drive growth of nominal GDP. So if you have a company that's growing like 6% a year um, or, or so, you know, in the 1900s, it was only paying a dividend of say like 3% uh, yield, let's say at like a 15 or 16 PE or something. And it was retaining the other part of it. In that case, you're getting dividend yield plus growth. That's correct. And that actually turns out to be about the stock's return. It grew about 6% a year. And, you know, like like Dow type companies and stuff grew maybe 6%, 5%, 6% a year, paid a dividend yield of 3 or 4% or whatever, and there's your whole return. But it's it was dividend yield. But dividend yield in those cases was really very free cash flow like. It was that was free cash flow. Um and so it if the earnings is something that really can't be turned into dividends, then we may have a big difference between earnings and uh, and free cash flow, and and that's something to think about the quality of the earnings and all that. And then, like I said, the Buffett test is the other part. Yes, if a company badly invests its uh, free cash flow, um, then you can really have a problem uh, there. Yeah, I thought it was a great post. My favorite paragraph was this one that I tweeted out, and you can read this for free at focuscompound.com, But you're talking about this concept that you just spoke about of tracking the flow, uh, because this free cash flow has to go somewhere. And like you use the example, you said a stock with a 15% free cash flow yield that is retained for six to seven years would end up with an enterprise value of zero, uh, which would be more cash than the market cap. So I thought that's a, a, a great paragraph, but the post was um, a great post. Anytime anyone asks this question going forward, I'm just going to send them this, uh, this write up. Yeah. That's good. Um, and that's also sometimes why I mentioned a difference between EBITDA and free cash flow when people value mm-hmm. off of EBITDA versus free cash flow. Uh, you know, EBITDA valuing it is fine for things, but you need to understand more about the company because we can't do just EBITDA plus growth because, you know, that could be tied up in all sorts of things that doesn't work the way that we talked about with this flow of the free cash flow. But if it's truly free cash flow, then, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's really the thing that drives value. And that's really b- basically Buffett's idea of owner earnings. You know, it's just a different way of looking at everything. But when you calculate it right, I think free cash flow plus growth is the most logical way to understand what you're going to get in a business over a very long period of time. Um, you know, if you hold it, obviously your real return in the stock is going to be very different because the price you got in and the price you got out. But putting those aside, you know. Oh, this is a good question. If you could change two incentives for every CEO tomorrow, what would it be and why? Two incentives. Um, well, I would. I think that it would be um, to have the CEO uh, compensation as much as possible be in the form of stock that can't be sold um, during their time at the company, basically. So, I mean, no one's going to agree to this, but my ideal, you know, incentives is really not about how big the bonus is or how whatever, but that it be in stock that is basically tied to your life expectancy. You know, if the actuarial table says that you're due to die 20, you have 20 years left, you know, remaining life expectancy um, from this moment that you should only be selling 5% of your stock. You should have to keep the other 95%, you know, um, to kind of zero out your balance as best as possible to approach that limit uh, at the time that you die. Um, there's different companies that try different things of, you know, invests over these five years, these 10 years, whatever. Um, but just the idea that it is thinking of it as an asset and as something that you can like sell down over time maybe, but is like this, this fund, this endowment thing over time, that kind of thinking about it to shift away from the idea of like a bonus, um, even if it is paid in bonuses and stuff and people like all those things. Um, if it was really tied as much as possible to um, the sense of like uh, a CEO's uh, having shareholder wealth type thing, thinking in the same sort of way as a shareholder that way would probably be one of my very top incentives. Um, so I, I'd say that's, Definitely one. Um, the other one, let's change two incentives. Um, so that would be very near the top. Um, I don't know if I could think of another one that I would. Well, I also would probably tie it to some things that you could. Well, this is strange, but 
I don't necessarily like the idea of not breaking down like earnings per share or return on equity or whatever into each of its parts. I think it would be better if it was, I mean, not into each of its parts. So just saying the return on equity, I think it would be better to target certain things that are actually controllable by the company. So, so one that's weird is like, um, let's say instead of an earnings per share target or something, I think I would want a target, let's say of like, you know, so a lot of companies do like an operating profit target. So operating profit is basically, um, it, you could think of it as revenue, gross profit, uh, um, and then your operating expenses and stuff. I would prefer if like you have to hit a goal of both of them. So let's say your EPS target is your, your operating profit target is, you know, uh, some amount that you have like a 10% margin or something, but that's only possible if you reduce your, I mean, like you have like $10 million or something, sorry. Um, it's only possible if you reduce your operating expenses or keep them in line with some sort of budget or something that way. Um, companies like Capital Cities and Teledyne and stuff for the general managers or for the heads of their business really did that with a budgeting each year saying, let's find a number for you to hit. And then you have to hit it. Not And often on not just a revenue side, but an expense side. And I, I think I would really like that. Um, like, so if you're Google or you're Meta or whatever, and you have really strong revenue growth in a year, and so you report good earnings per share, but actually your operating expenses grew faster than you planned at the beginning of the year, I would, you only get half the bonus. The The goal should be to have half of your attention on the expense side and half on the um, revenue generating side. You shouldn't be offsetting one with the other, I think. Next question, would just like to see an example of Jeff calculating net tangible assets. Um, I would say just go to Focus Compounding and in the search, type in net tangible assets. And there's a few posts where he had uh, done exactly that, uh, went through and calculated and showed you how he came up with that. So it's a good place to do it. Um, Here's an interesting question. Can you talk about the cheapest stock you've ever seen and the context around why it was so cheap? Hmm. I mean, I... It, it depends. Statistically, I've seen ch- stocks that are theoretically incredibly cheap because uh, they're frauds and things like that. But things that actually have real value. Um, I can think of some. You know, we've okay, done research so on we, both. We drove past something that was pretty cheap, right? Do you remember? Yeah. That was I, wrote, I wrote down two. I wrote down two, and both of them are land based, and both of them are okay. controlled. Both controlled. of them, you could never do anything. It's a land yeah. bank. But if it were liquidated, it would be worth, I mean, multiples, multiples, multiple, multiple, multiples. It, yeah, so the highest and best use in some cases of the land is is several times at least more than the the company uh, sells for in the market. But they have someone who in, isn't interested in liquidating the company or realizing the value or whatever. Um, and I would say that's the reason that no one can go activist on it. Um, that there's no way to get this person out and to realize the value, and that they you know don't really use debt and they don't really um, uh, they're just basically holding the land with some expenses attached and stuff. So over time it's really not going up in value. They're, they're managing to have their expenses and stuff almost take, you know, almost negate much of the increase in value each year from owning the land. Um, so it's, you kind of got a negative carry cost and stuff with that. And so it's not as good as if you could own the land yourself. Um, I would say those are, some of the biggest reasons uh, other things i've seen that are very cheap um very hard to access markets i've seen things that are very cheap um so you know um tiny tiny markets even i think in japan i mentioned some regional markets or had some stuff that was cheaper than things that were in tokyo um i once did a post where i tried to get people to guess just from the numbers what some stock uh, would trade at or something. And I used an example of a Bermuda stock, uh, local Bermuda stock. Bermuda is a country of only like 60,000 people or something. Uh, they have a couple local businesses that trade on their stock exchange. It's almost impossible for people to get access to that stock exchange. Um, so sometimes there are things there locally that trade at absurd um, values. Like for mm-hmm. instance, they might trade at 70 or 80% less than the value of their assets. Um, you know, and things like that. Um, so they're most obviously cheap that way. Sometimes there are things that are cheap on like a, um, upside quantitative, whatever basis. Um, but they have a chance of not working out. And so I would kind of put those in a different class. They might be cheaper, but they're not, uh, they're not like as certain. So those are just examples of the really certain ones. Um, 
usually it's asset stuff. I would say I don't. I can't think of many cases where I see super cheap earning stuff. I'm looking at one of the ones that we were talking about, and it looks like it's trading at a 30% cash flow yield. So let alone the land and the value of the land is probably incredibly high based on where it currently trades in the market cap right now. It's probably like a 20 or a 30% uh, cash flow yield. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, there's just dual class stock. I mean, mm-hmm. it, or, I mean, just there's no, you could never do anything as an individual investor investing in this company. Yeah. And then there are some companies in which they're not controlled exactly or whatever, but they, um, you know, I, th- I think I've, I've mentioned net nets before and stuff. So like um, recently there are a few companies that are right on the borderline of being a net net or not. We talked about Lakeland. That's one of them. Um, Stratic, which is an auto parts company. Um, Jerish, which is a like a textiles thing. And, you know, it, it does contract um, apparel stuff in Jordan. Um some of those mm-hmm. are, you know, if they, ha- it, those are typical of like what a net net type thing will be. That is very common, which is fear that there will be no earnings right now. Um, like they'll decline and then they won't have earnings or they haven't had earnings recently. Um, but they have a lot of assets, which in theory would generate a lot of earnings in a good period. That's the cigar butt type thing, right? So um, it can get very cheap because, um if they have a good year, things will work out well, but they just haven't shown any ability to generate earnings for a long time. Um, those aren't necessarily the cheapest stocks, but just in terms of a obvious test is that being a net net is pretty cheap. And um, those are good indications of that. Um, but controlled, obscuring the earnings power, um, not communicating with the public. I mean, like, say, so for like restaurant stocks or something, I think we've said, you know, I think Flanagan's is a lot cheaper than most restaurant stocks and it's family controlled, mm-hmm. doesn't say anything, doesn't talk to anyone, doesn't tell you <laughs> what they're doing. Um, and in fact, I think if you look at the history there, it's it's a little more complicated. Um, but if you look at like the longer term history, I've pointed out some people, um, there's even in terms of like, if you look over balance sheets for the last 10 years, cash flow for the last 10 years versus income statements and stuff, they're not doing anything to help you think their earnings are particularly good or to advertise the fact of value and where it's going and whatever. Um, so it's, you know, it's different from other companies that way. Um, so I guess, you know, completely not advertising what you're doing and um, would be another example. Um of that uh, and being controlled because see if something like Flanagan's wasn't controlled, someone would go after it. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt um, that they would buy up a stake and go activist on it and stuff. Yeah. So typically it's because the shareholder base, uh, there's a control situation. Somebody owns a big Mm -hmm. block of stock. There's nothing that outside investors could do to realize that value. Absolutely. There's no market for control of the company. It's sort of like when I wrote the letter to the board of bank insurance and that if you read the proxies, the, the, uh, not the proxy, but the, uh, yeah, the proxy, the, uh, background to the deal and everything where they talk about the fairness opinion and everything. Basically part of it is they say like, we didn't consider book value because the company's worth more, uh, on a ongoing basis than liquidated. And, um, you know, we weren't going to sell to somebody else basically. So mm-hmm. it was like, we have this deal or we can continue as it is and stuff. But there, in other words, uh, there's someone involved with it controlling and stuff that's saying, let's not liquidate or um, let's not sell out to someone or something. So in that case, not any insurance company could come up to them and say, I want to buy you. And the cases we talked about, no one can tell them to sell off the land and stuff. They don't want to do it. So a lot of, it's usually asset-based things, not earnings-based things. And it's some sort of entrenched management um, control and stuff that aren't going to let you immediately realize the value of the company. Though sometimes like it's terrible businesses, but sometimes it's not terrible businesses. It's just what I said. Like no one sees a pathway to realizing the value. All right, next question. When a low debt slash cash generating company with a well-established investment plan for that cash sees its share price drop a lot, is it worth interrupting that investment plan to buy back shares? Or is it worthwhile adding debt to fund a buyback while continuing to invest? Uh, I, I would say the second one. Yeah. I mean, ideally you add debt, you know, Buffett's talked about this and I'm a big believer in this, you know, borrow money when it's easy to get and cheap enough and stuff, you know, manage your liability separately from your assets as much as possible. 
make the purchases investments when they're attractive and raise the money when it's attractive to raise it. Don't do it at the same time to try to maximize the efficiency that you have. But you know, that's because look now the market's down 25%, but okay, that's a lot more expensive. So, you know, trying to, you know, borrow a bunch of money and buy back stock and stuff, you know, um, might not work out as well, right? Because someone might have to borrow at seven when they could have borrowed at, you know, four something before or whatever. So when you kind of do the math on that, well, that kind of offsets the 25% if you're funding a hundred percent with debt. Um, yeah, but I think, uh, large scale buybacks, um, that are done as like tenders or just aggressively buying back in certain periods when the stock is doing badly is the best idea. Um, I, you know, I don't, certainly don't think that you should ever change um, what you're doing inside the business to maximize um, like the buyback. The the best use for most companies is uses inside the business. You shouldn't be like increase, uh, you know, greatly uh, increasing or decreasing um, your spending plans so that you can like fund a buyback or something like that. I think you should add debt for that. Next question. How does one go about learning new industries slash sectors and how to analyze companies in those industries? Is it a matter of reading 10 Ks or is there more to it? Uh, I think reading 10 Ks is a good way of doing it. You can read investor presentations and, and things like that. Um, you know, for a group of companies all that are as similar as possible to each other to try to understand the differences that they think um, exist, you know, similarities and differences so you can kind of understand the business better that way. Reading one alone isn't really that helpful. Um, sometimes talking to people who know the industry might be really helpful too. Um, you know, for a part of this, I would say um, read Phil Fisher and read um, Peter Lynch. I think those two are the best at like, explaining how to learn about an industry, how to get scuttlebutt and how to get uh, an understanding and the understanding that you need to know, like what are the key numbers to buy something and to see if something's doing well or not. And talking to people, those two, I, you know, they're, they're very good that way. So, you know, what, um, one up on wall street is actually better than people think on that kind of stuff. And obviously famously, um, common stocks and uncommon profits is, but those are the two books to read about that. Yeah. I would say, Get a group of public companies in the industry, read every single 10K, and you'll learn a lot about the industry. If they're all talking about a single data point or factor or KPI, that's probably something that they care a lot about and something you should pay attention to. So I think you can learn a lot about the industry if you just pick a group of stocks in that industry. So maybe it's competitors to the company that you are interested in, and you'll learn a lot about the industry from doing that. Uh, next question. In a dividend discount model. <laughs> this is going to be very mathy. I think we should skip yeah. this one. Yeah. D read the uh, the free cash flow post. I think it's the same person. Okay. Uh, what valuation methods do you use other than a DCF to find intrinsic value? Uh, read the um, free cash flow post. Okay. I believe you folks are a pretty concentrated fund. What's the max position size at cost would you put on a single position? How large would you let those positions get, even if you believe intrinsic value is well above the current price of that position? Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, so like, you know, we have managed accounts in a fund. In the fund, I'd say that technically like the max position size and stuff has to do with if we're expecting flows in or not and stuff. So we probably had something that was a large position size that cost when the expectation was for a lot of money to come in and so it was going to be immediately watered down so i wouldn't really count that um i think the how large would we let the positions get is trickier um i'm not sure about that i've thought about that uh we haven't been tested too hard on that uh but a little bit because sometimes one stock might go up a lot more than the others um you know for an individual investor, I don't think that matters. It really doesn't. Uh, it can be painful for a professional because of timing issues. Uh, if you have a position that gets large and then comes down or whatever, uh, you know, falling in one quarter or one year or whatever, it can make one year look really good and then one year look really bad. Um, and those sorts of uh, issues that you have um, from that. So... I think it is much more of a concern for a professional investor than an individual. Um, I think for individuals, how large you let positions get and all that, I think that really depends on your willingness to take the loss. And that also should depend on the permanent loss of capital 
And uh, for a lot of businesses, like the kind that Buffett invests in or something, it's more realistic to expect like that you could lose half of the value of the stock or something, not 100%. You shouldn't think when Buffett invests in Occidental, that has a higher chance of very large losses as compared to investing in Coke when he did in the 80s, you know? So um, I, I think you should weight it more and maybe Coke would be more appropriate to be a particularly large position than Occidental just because the when you adjust it for the potential size of the loss, which is really what matters, um, you have that. Uh, entire industry or something or entire risk, I would group together. I've said this before. So I don't want to be overly concentrated in banks or overly concentrated in uh, an insurance thing or a whatever or things that are all in one currency going that way without being hedged or whatever. But it's that risk of things going together that way. That would be um, the issue for me. And so um, that'd be true whether I invest in you know five different ones or one. It's not about one stock or something. It's one risk or not. Um, so sometimes I would group all stocks uh, with taking the same sort of risk together and uh, I probably think less about an individual stock uh, position size than most investors do. I think about the risk that I'm taking and what could go wrong, right? And so um, I think sometimes people think they're spread around a bunch of different positions and, you know, what does it matter that way? You know, mm-hmm. when I invested in a bunch of Japanese net nets, they're the same thing. So I went to 50% on that. You could say, I, I didn't quite get to 50%, but I wanted to get to 50%. So I was willing to. Um, so in that case, you could say, well, he was only willing to go up to 9 or 10% or whatever in a single position. But obviously, they're all together one trade that way. Um, on the other hand, you have a little bit more diversity in that they were all in different industries and everything. But it's it's very similar. So like in that sense, I was willing to do a really big um, position that way. Um, and personally, I'd be willing to do very, very large. I mean, I, I did, I tried to, again, couldn't get as much as I wanted, but tried to do very big in bank insurance. Um, you know, f- personally, I, I would be more of the monger approach or whatever on those um, in terms of really high degrees of concentration. But professionally, I would say less concentrated than I would be personally. Though still very high compared to other professionals. Yeah. Alrighty. Next question. So he quote retweeted his own tweet. His own original tweet was that's a good observation. Most moats belong to mature businesses. I'm interested in the relatively rare small and micro cap moats. Over the counter market comes to mind. And then his response to uh, our Q and A was something about this would be interesting. Small micro cap competitive advantages versus mature company competitive advantages. So do you have any sort of thoughts on you know small to micro versus very large, immature, competitive an- advantages? Uh, I, I think small and micro are more likely to the founder to be very important, the person currently running it. Um, and I think that a specific brand or like intangible asset or something like that could be really key. Um, even things like where you talk about location advantages, that's almost yeah, regional. never... Yeah, like those location advantages they talk about in textbooks and things. Okay, I mean, maybe there's a few companies that are a giant copper mine somewhere or whatever that have that advantage or, or, you know, a port or whatever. But generally, those are really seen in small businesses and they can be very strong in small businesses. But large businesses just do not have a lot in the way of like location advantages and things like that. Um, So I think organizationally, uh, larger companies often have systems that they've developed and organizations and ways of running things that can be... uh, uh, that you could uh, underestimate and th- those could be really important versus the small and micro cap companies. Um, it, maybe they're harder to identify in the small and micro cap, um, but clear like just location advantages and intangible asset advantages and also just the actual person, like a single individual, uh, I think have a really important part to play in small and micro. Mm-hmm. Um you know, even things when we talk about like small companies versus large companies at the same same time in their history or something, the specific person running Southwest Airlines probably matters a lot in the first few years. The uh, the system there matters more later or Costco or whatever. Um, and it's a little bit different between a personality driven thing and a process uh, or philosophy driven thing. Um, and I think that's a very big difference between them. But yeah, like you said, the location thing I think is really key. The other thing is there's really... One thing you can have is small and micro cap companies are more likely to have a totally undiluted 
um, sort of advantage that's very rare among giant companies in that if they have a terrific brand or product or whatever that's super dominant, they might not be more diversified than that. So the amazing thing about like Buffett owning Apple, uh, Apple is more of a giant company in terms of its product than people realize because there are lots of giant companies or there are some giant companies that might uh, be you know, within spinning distance of Apple size at times, but they don't get it from such a small group of products. iPhone alone is huge. Um, and, you know, Coke is similar to that. He has a history of betting really big on like a single brand or something that's huge. Um, so you get a lot more of that in the really small uh, stocks that you might have something that's really all about one brand or whatever. It's not diluted. It's not the Procter & Gamble type approach. Okay, so I think we've gotten three questions on CarMart, so we should probably go over it. Um, uh, the Rational Walk says, I know you deal in, in small caps, but aside from that, what do you and Jeff think of KMX and CRMT on a comparative basis? And then somebody else mm-hmm. had asked, um, let me scroll, where was it? So regarding CarMart, what changes or trends in the business would Jeff view as a red flag? Like loan duration, extension, capital allocation changes, securitization, emphasis on growth versus collections, et cetera. Thanks. So any general thoughts on CarMart? I read their most recent releases, I believe, for each of them. Um, certainly read the transcript for for, for CarMax. And um, yeah, I did the same. Re- read the transcript and, and the um, earnings release um, for CarMart. And I, I looked at the 10 Qs. I, I don't think I like really looked carefully at the CarMax um, 10 Q, but read the earnings release and the um, transcript. Um I think they're really different businesses. Uh, I don't think people appreciate uh, that I've talked to. I know don't appreciate it as much how, you know, super subprime, a real lending company Carmart is um, than anything else. And I know the company is now talking about itself as being more sales oriented and everything. And also I, I think, you know, actually visiting some of the locations or the towns that this is in would help people understand that with America's Carmart. Like someone asked me a question about how they managed to, sell the amount that they do in terms of units on a lot with as low inventory as they do, you know, the turns. And I've gotten a question like that before about CarMart. Um, you don't really get selection. That's, that's, they're going to prove you and uh, they're going to tell you how with your paycheck, they can get you into a car that will, you know, get you to work and stuff. Um, that's what you're there for. And that's, all that they're providing. Um, you might get here are three possibilities, you know, if you, um, or you might not, but it, it's not, let's come here and check out um, what models you want and everything. Um, so they, they do not need wide selection in the towns that they're in. Um, so I think it's really different. Uh, obviously people are really scared about what's about to happen with Carmart, right? Like you can mm-hmm. look at the, the stock. So there's some good and bad things I think people should be aware of. Um, one, there's terrible stuff in terms of affordability. So the potential losses that they could have might be much larger than they would be in other cycles because there'd just be more of a loan that they could lose money on and they could lose stuff in an aftermarket for a car that they repossessed or whatever too. And there's just a lot more at stake that way. Um, on the other hand, as compared to a lot of banking things and stuff that you see, the truth is their funding is more equity based. So they actually don't borrow a particularly large amount of their loan book. Um, so if you look at their loan book, let's say they borrow, um, you know, let, I don't know what it is as of today, but they, well, we can look at it. So accounts receivable. So they're doing securitized and stuff and, and things like that. So that's a little different, but accounts receivable, we see there, and this is the net number. So it's net of like, so 924. So that might be net, uh, so 924 million. So the actual book might be like 1.2 billion and they put aside, you know, the, 300 million or something in expected um, losses on that provisions. Um, and then if we look down on debt, can we do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, I see it. Okay. All right. So they have about half of their, um, let's see, they have short-term debt too. So let's say half um, that they, they have over half of their um, loan book they're borrowing. So the rest of it is provided by the fact that they have um, that they've actually put in your shareholder money into it. Um, that's plenty of leverage and you could be worried about that and stuff. But I do want to point out that from a financial perspective um, compared to other financials, other banks and things that 
they aren't as sensitive to short-term funding costs as you might think. The duration on their loans, although it's much longer than it used to be, is very short compared to like other banks and things. So there's significantly less interest rate risk here. Um, now, they are more marginal borrower um, th themselves, I mean, like um, if credit, if um, financial conditions are really tight and stuff, this is something where there'd be more worry about that. And, you know, I have no idea if you'd be able to secure the IS things and all that. Um, and so the other fear obviously is that they all have um, high loan losses and all of that. Um, that's possible. I, I more would be more concerned with the affordability issue, but obviously there could be a real issue in terms of people being unable to pay um, for uh, to, to make the payments and then to have actual losses on the cars because they were very expensive um, at the time that Carmart bought them and everything uh, because you had high used car prices. Um, it's, it's very cheap. I mean, to be honest with you, it's very, very cheap. And it's one of the cheapest financial things I'm aware of in which there's not severe interest rate risk of the sense that uh, just the Fed raising rates enough could cause horrific things to happen. Um, mm -hmm. So so if you look at most financial things, we haven't talked a lot about this. I've just said like it's an issue. But if you look at most financial things that look like they're good business, but something's really like the, the price to book is really compressed and stuff, it's because investors are looking at the interest rate risk. And they're very aware of like that a frost, for instance, is... It, in a better position as a bank than a bank that's all based on mortgage lending or whatever um, things and, and using um, time deposits. So there's huge differences in the performance of some banks that way. And um, Carmart is very, very cheap relative to the returns on this portfolio um, of loans that it has, to be honest, like price to book is less than one, which almost never happens. Like, for a very long with this company because, um, you know, the return on book has probably been 15%. Um, you know, that's a leverage return. It's probably 10% on the, or more than 10%, but like, you know, 15%, 10% or whatever after tax returns long-term in their history without, um, leverage. And then, you know, with leverage and stuff, maybe 15% or something, but you know, it, obviously, I mean, it's a pretty valuable, um, loans to have. I mean, uh, you know, I think it does it let's now quick MS treats it like categorizes it as if it's like a retailer and stuff. Yeah. So it doesn't show you that information, but basically the yields are high. Um, so you have large net interest margin and it does well, even after you um, take into account the large um, provision for losses. And it's, I mean, it's really not very long-term the, the, um, loans that you're making. So the, the, you know, the, um, uh, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know if they had it, uh, if they said exactly what it was most recently, I'm sure that they said, but they give you like the, um, weighted average, um, uh, number of months left on their loans, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, they can modify things and stuff. So it's not guaranteed that that's what it's going to be. But let's say that it's, you know, even at the time that they make these loans, you know, 40 months or something is long. So you're talking about things that on average, obviously, if you keep making new loans, uh, um, but you have some of the other ones are aging. Um, you're talking about things where you're taking like less than three years. Um, you know, that's a different part, you know, uh, you're getting, I mean, let me put it this way. Like um, what they're charging their customers and stuff is like um, in terms of the spreads that they have on and, and, and stuff like that is um, very distressed. You'd have to buy very distressed um, bonds to get those kinds of spreads on the yields that you have. And you'd probably be taking more risk in terms of how far out you're going to go in terms of number of years. You're not going to get so much of the cash flow back so quickly. So um because so one part of it is that the number of years that they have is fairly short compared to other things like houses. Um, but the other is that the interest rate is quite high. And so having a very high interest rate means that more of the 
interest of the total payments that you get overall is interest and it's paid faster, you know, um, overall than having some lump sum at the end, like a bond. So it, they're just significantly less at risk to uh, interest rate stuff than we talked about with other things. Um, it's a lot of concern about obviously a bad recession and things like that. Um, I don't know. I, I think in general, if you look at the history of this company, um, obviously it's not good for loan losses when you have a period like that. But I think lending more aggressively to customers who sometimes are in better times and sometimes in worse times uh, isn't as consistent a result as you get here where their customers are poor through all periods mm-hmm. of the cycle, you know? Was, wasn't it Munger that like hated on this industry because he said he didn't want to, he wouldn't want to be part of an industry where the lender is basically hoping they default on their loan, their subprime loan, so they could take the car back and basically do it all over again. Yeah, I think that's a fair... And there's the other side of that, right? You could play the other side and say, well, they're also giving, you know, uh, allowing somebody to sign on a car and and have transportation. And I I could see both sides. Yes, I uh, do see both sides. Um, I don't know that ethically it's particularly good or, or, um, I think his point was, it's just, it would be an awkward business to where you're kind of hoping they default. So you could just go in and take the car back, take possession of the car and go and do it all over again, because that's when they make a lot of money. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I also think they'd be happy for you to keep trading in for new cars and uh, keep making all your payments on time, but never get into a more successful uh, situation in terms of your life. Obviously, you know, if you're, if if you, I mean, if you pay on time and stuff, but you're never able to increase your income much, um, then y- you're a very good customer to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so they'd like, they'd like to see that. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of like over the counter markets talks about that. They graduated to an exchange. I mean, we lost the customer. Yes. If things go well for your customer, they're no longer your customer base. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's absolutely true here. Um, I don't, this isn't a very discretionary thing in general, what they are. Um, so defaults that you'll see here, you know, I, I just, we'll see what happens. It's, it's obviously a big concern, but some of these companies grew up, the Carmart among them, in periods in which recessions like the one we might be likely to see were more common and have experience with this in the long ago past. Not in the recent past, though. I actually think to some extent what worried me more was what was happening a few years ago where money was too loose. Um, that actually was more scary to me long term for a business like this because I think that there is a deterioration in underwriting stuff and risk being taken over time. And um, I, I think that the very easy rates for a very long time actually aren't good for this industry and they're very bad for the customers. Um, you know, th- that wasn't good that, <laughs> that you've had car prices go up so much. I mean, car prices that, you know, the fed, uh, you know, uh, the government and the fed uses these statistics and stuff, the inflation statistics, but makes adjustments for improvements in quality and things. Um, it's become that the amount that you have to pay every few weeks to have basic transportation, a car that's eight years old or something, and was, ne- you know, never the most popular model and everything, um, has gone up a lot over time relative to people's wages. It- it's not an easy situation, actually. Uh, it's, it's been pretty bad. And, um, I think it's less noticeable to people who have access to credit um, you know, prime customers and for people who pay up for cars that are getting other things out of them besides just the most basic transportation they can get. But, um, I think that they've become a lot less affordable over time. And actually I think longer term, the biggest risk for CarMart, they would say, and and I think so is that like the affordability situation is really bad now to the point that, you know, how does this business model work for long? Um, you might think, oh, having high car prices is good for them. You don't want them to drop and everything, but they need to find out some way to make this affordable for customers to be able to make these payments. Um, so 
they would i think they would say they would prefer a more normal market than what they're experiencing we could uh go through one more question which which i sure. thought was a good one um said if we have a lost decade what's the best way to consider our investments for the foreseeable future um well, I'm not sure exactly if I know what a lost decade is. Um, I mean, we could we have <laughs> you know a lost what decade other people st- say though. What, you know what the other people mean when they say it though. Uh, well, I mean, if we have a well, if we have a lost decade, like um, I mean, like Japan had a lost decade where they didn't have economic growth and stuff. Basically, um, certainly the United States had a lost decade in terms of stocks and stuff from the late '60s to the early '80s. Um, in fact, it may have been closer to 15 years than 10. Um, so you know, the things that worked for Buffett and for um, uh peter kundal and those you know so like you know um read those chapters of the snowball mm-hmm. when he's investing in the early days of berkshire when he's investing in washington post and the ad agencies and all that stuff the uh, there's always something to do um you know uh there was a version of the intelligent investor that came out in the 70s um that was the one that buffett worked on but it's not credited um so those would be good things to to look at for you know what worked then so more of an active approach right instead of just like buying and closing your eyes and everything going up well for one thing what we just talked about a little bit shorter duration uh, as a technical concept would work better probably uh you would not want to invest generally in things that have no um cash returns now promise returns in the long future from now uh, take lots of interest rate risk, things like that. Uh, um, I, I would guess that that sort of time is uh, what you want to avoid. So when we're talking about car and stuff, something like that might work out better than you think. Um, although what's scary about that is in a sharp recession, it won't feel that way. Um, so it's not always clear when you're in a decade that doesn't go well, that it's just uh, a period that over a a, f- a full 10 year period or whatever, isn't that good. It may consist of periods that are um, more frightening in terms of how sharp the downturn is at certain points. And then you have large recoveries at times. Um, if things are just going to go nowhere for the next 10 years, I don't think that car mart would be as cheap as it is. I think it's immediate fear of like what will happen in the next year that would be causing it to get as cheap as it is. Like that it's a particular part of the market you want to avoid. A lot of people do that. A lot of institutions do that and stuff. I also think that's why you get out of Cinemark and Six Flags and stuff, even if it doesn't rationally make a ton of sense to me. Anything that's like consumer, whatever, you just you flee those things if you're expecting a, a, that where you're in a recession or about to be in a recession or something like that. Mm-hmm. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. This was our monthly Q&A. Uh, so we will do another one in November. So to be on the lookout for that, make sure you follow me on Twitter at, at Focus Compound. If you want to get access to everything that we put out into the world, that's the best place to um, uh, follow that on Twitter at Focus Compound. Uh, if you like free stuff, you can go to FocusCompound.com. All of Jeff's blog posts, everything he's ever written on investing is centralized at FocusCompound.com for free for you to read and learn whatever he had written about. Uh, but you can click that invest with us section to get more information on uh, our money management services. We have our presentation there and everything on that. If you want to learn more about that, reach out to me at Andrew at Focus Compounding.com and we can start the conversation. I want to thank you so much for all the support. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, leave us a rating review, and we'll see you in the next podcast. Take care.